Hello and welcome back to Grassroots Crypto, where I like to talk about crypto. In today's video, we'll be continuing the Thor view series and talking about the Thor chain vaults and the incentive pendulum in detail. In the last video, we talked a lot about nodes. What do they look like? Uh, where do you get more information about a node? Where do they live? What skills are required to run a node? What's in a node? The risks of being a node operator. If you haven't seen that video, check it out now and come back to this video. This video is going to be the second video covering ThorChain Thor nodes, also known as Thor nodes. So let's have a look at vaults and how they work. There are two vaults within ThorChain, the Asgard vault and the Yggdrasar vault. The Asgard vault is the primary vault that holds the majority of the funds. This includes all of the node operators bond. The node is always changing due to churn and this happens every two days. So there's always a new vault that gets created. Then we have the Yggdrasil vault. Each node has a Yggdrasil vault and it's a part of the node deployment. There are currently 36 nodes here within um, ChaosNet and each one of them has a Yggdrasil vault, hence 36 Yggdrasil vaults. As a collective, they can be thought of as the secondary vault. As I said in the previous video, the Asgard Vault is more like a semi or a truck. It can hold lots of funds, but it's a bit slow. Whereas the Yggdrasil Vault is like a Lamborghini. It can't hold much, but it's quite fast. The Asgard Vault holds the majority of the funds and is responsible mainly for adding and removing liquidity, whereas the Yggdrasil Vaults do the swaps because they're very fast doing swaps. Unless they're too big for any one of the Yggdrasil Vaults to do, in which case the Asgard Vault will do the swap. Let's go have a look at the vaults and then we can talk more about them. So this is ViewBlock, the ThorChain Block Explorer. And in here, if you go to the vault section, you're going to find all of the vaults that ThorChain has. The top one's always going to be the Asgard Vault. So let's go have a look at that. So here we have the Asgard Vault. We know it's the Asgard Vault because of the vault type Asgard. So that's nice. And here we have the connected chain. And being ChaosNet currently, there's only the Binance chain connected. But in multi-chain, there'll be, you know, different symbols for Bitcoin, Ethereum, and so on and so forth. These are all the transactions that um, the Asgard Vault has, has happened. And you won't, you won't see massive um, amounts of transactions in and out because as I said, this changes um, every two days. This is the uh, assets that the Asgard Vault holds. Um, as you can see, it's quite a lot and also has uh, the amount or the, yeah, the amount of each asset that is currently holding. So uh, what's that 56 million rune as an example, the Asgard Vault is currently holding. As the Asgard Vault holds most of the funds, sometimes the Yggdrasil Vaults need to be topped up. So you can go along here and you can do type um, Yggdrasil and you can see it being topped up or Yggdrasil add. So we can see this happening here. ThorChain does move funds between vaults to optimize the network um, as what's happened faster from the Yggdrasil Vault than it does from the Asgard Vault. So we go back and let's have a look at some of these Yggdrasil Vaults. Just picking anyone at random here. So we can see here the vault type, uh, the connected chain, so it's very much like an Asgard vault within what it, what it can do and what it looks like. And you can see here, because th this vault is um, from a node operator, this would be the bond that the node operators actually put through. And this would be the node operator's address. If we went to um, here and we looked at the, uh, the node addresses or we went to the um, floorchain.net, we'd actually be able to find that node operator. Uh, let's go back. So that's the, uh, we've got the address there. Then we also, you can look at the different transactions and all this type of stuff that it's, that it's had. So there are some special ratios with regard to the Yggdrasil Vault. The amount of funds it can store is in proportion to the amount of bond that it's put in. So for simple maths, just to say it put in $1 million worth of rune, not actual rune, um, it would only be able to hold $250,000 worth of assets uh, here. And this is to ensure that no single node operator is holding too many funds and that the bonded rune that it's put on is going to protect the assets for which the node operator has a control of. So that's for any one vault. And if we go look at the vaults, the 36 combined, 36 volts combined, can't hold more than 50% of the network's value. If we go have a look at some constants, Right, so when we go to the Thor chain constants, this is on um, the current chaos net. If we go down here, this has all information of, of like network constants, obviously, for the uh, for Thor chain. Um, a couple of things here. So 
side note, um, Min Bond In, it's set to a million dollars, but it's got an override. So the actual current uh, minimum bond is 300,000. There's a bit of confusion, I've seen that uh, on the chat. Um, but the, what we're looking for here, as far as that 50% I'm talking about, is the, the combined Yugodosol uh, fund limit is 50%. So the, the combined, that 36, when you combine the 36 nodes, you can't have more than 50% of the funds stored in those Yugodosol vaults. Hence the Asgard vault needs to be the primary vault. Generally, the actual value is gonna be about 25% due to the individual Yugodosol limit that we talked about before. However, if a node operator was to bond in like 100 million rune or something ridiculous like that, it would stop that node operator from holding anything close to 50% of the funds since as a collective, 50% could only be held within the Yugoslav vaults. This is to stop any individual node operator having too many funds in their own vault. It is important to note that the node operators hold the Yugoslav vault and they can, with some advanced knowledge, steal the funds within the Yugoslav vault as in like all the funds that are stored in here. Or if they're very sloppy with security practices, perhaps some malicious actor can come in along and steal all of those funds as well. The node operators do not host or have any such control over the Asgard vault, which is why the Asgard vault holds the node's bond as well as the majority of the funds. No node operator can control the critical amount of funds stored inside of the Asgard vault. To continue this hypothetical situation of a bad node operator with 100 million rune um, stealing all the funds from the Yugodosol vault, they would more than certainly be churned out in the next churn for bad behavior. It doesn't really matter how much bond they had, they would have accrued a huge amount of slash points against them. Additionally, node operators via a majority vote have the option to ban and expel a node operator in between churns. Uh, this has been done before in testnet and i remember voting when that happened while it does cost node operators room to vote out and ban a node operator um, it is quite possible and a likely outcome if there was a bad actor in the future so now let's talk about the incentive pen. this ideal ratio protects the network because the bond acts like insurance for the assets within the liquidity pool so we can see here so half of the rune of this two-third comes from the bond and the other it comes from within the liquidity pool. So if this is our liquidity pool and this is our bonded rune over here. And this is what's known as the optimal state. We want this type of state as it's um, safe and efficient for the network. It's an efficient utilization of capital as well as safe to ensure that there's sufficient bond capital to, you could say, ensure um, the assets within the liquidity pools that the liquidity providers have um, put in. This, this one third, two third ratio is also mirrored here as the system income split, one third to liquidity providers and two thirds to the node operators. This ratio is subject to change depending on the position of the incentive pendulum. So this is the optimal um, split of the system income. However, it may change depending on what's happening. So let's go have a look at some examples. Unsafe is where there are too much assets inside the liquidity pools and not enough bonded rune by active node operators. When BEP swap started, staking caps were put in place to stop this from happening, to give node operators time to put in enough rune into the network to secure it. When it first started, the first uh, minimum bond was about 10,000 rune, then it went up to 100,000 rune, and then now we're eventually, as you saw, at 300,000 rune as minimum bond, and now node operators are setting their own price due to the competition between node operators. We're on that later. So when there's not enough bond to back or ensure the liquidity inside the liquidity pools, the incentive pendulum swings away from the stakers or the liquidity providers and towards the node operators to encourage node operators to bond more or to encourage liquidity providers or rune holders to become node operators. Unsafe is really the only state of concern. As it says, this is undesirable because it means that it becomes profitable for node operators to work together to steal assets. E.g. there is less room to access insurance against the node operators stealing those funds, which obviously is not a good place to be. Looking at an inefficient state, this is the exact opposite to an unsafe state. There is too much bond compared to assets in the liquidity pool, so it's inefficient use of capital on behalf of the node operators. So the incentive pendulum swings towards liquidity providers 
and rewards them over the node operators, as you can see here. So increases for liquidity providers, decreases for node operators. This is done to encourage node operators to reduce the amount of bond they have and put it into liquidity pools. And whether unsafe or inefficient, this would change the ratio or the numbers of the system income split. E.g. this could be um, two thirds and this could be one third. So the incentive pendulum directly controls the split of system income rewards and when it is outside of the ideal or optimal state, it changes the split of the system income to incentivize the movement of liquidity either from node operators to liquidity pools or the other way around. There are in between states of overbonded and underbonded. So currently within the network, we are overbonded, e.g. there is more bond than what is required. And we can see this by going to the Delphi dashboard and having a look and see it says it's overbonded. And this is the current split. So the bond is 78.6% and the room state is 21%. And over here, if we go to the pool overview, you can see the incentive pendulum is moving more towards the stakers or the liquidity providers, um, when ideally it would be like, you know, more in the middle. So, if we go here, there is an interactive model for the incentive pendulum, which I've prepared before, and this is the current state we're at. So rune bonded to um, rune pooled, which I grab the details um, from here. And what that means is, again, there's more bonded than assets that's, or, or pooled capital, as they call it here, um, or assets in liquidity pools. And you can use this interactive model to kind of change it and move it back and forth. So we're kind of like just a little bit more than over bonded. So then why are we overbonded? Why are we in this state here? Before node operators are bonding too much rune than is required. So maybe like we've got a million here. Um, I think I've seen uh, more than this in some of them. Uh, yeah, what, what 1.1 million here uh, of rune. So that's more than in some cases double than what is required to be a node operator. Also node operators are putting in more bond than is required um, as they're in competition with themselves to ensure, as an example, a standby node operator is gonna become an active node operator as it's active node operators that get the rewards. So having a look at this, it seems to be a bit of both. Bonding more than double than what's required and adding more bond than is required for fear of not being selected in the next churn. The incentives are there for node operators to become a liquidity provider or even to create another node However, they are not doing anything about it. It's been like this for a while and I don't see it changing anytime soon. Maybe it will when uh, multi-chain Chaos Net comes in. This means that compared to being in the ideal state, more funds are within the Asgard vault. More funds can be added to BEPSwap without requiring more bond here. And of course, more system income or rewards are being paid to liquidity providers. So let's just look at risks and compensation. I know that we talked about risks a little bit in the last video. So just to touch on this again, these risks, or you can say these potential penalties are over and above the incentive pendulum. This is the part where we talked about the one times five transaction value of node operators try and steal funds uh, from within their Yugoslav vault. Now let's look at, look at compensation. Being a node operator can be quite lucrative and quite profitable. So I know that in the early stages of BEPSwap, node operators were getting over $10,000 USD a month and for about a hosting cost of $1,000 a month. So that's quite a good profit. I'm not sure what the actual uh, profits for a node operator are now, given the price and the incentive pendulum and stuff like that. However, I do expect it's quite a good deal. So to track income and, and how node operators are paid, there are some formulas here you can look at. And there's an example. So for 33 nodes, obviously there are currently 36 in CalSnet. So this is the type of uh, reward you can get in Rune over a month. And given the price of Rune now, that is quite nice when you're looking at, say, $2,000 a month of fixed costs for hosting. So there's a lot of responsibility on node operators. However, there's also a lot of benefits if they're going to do the right thing. So just linking this at the end of the video, this is the latest release for the Asgard X interface. Um, node management for node operators is gonna get even better. They have a bit for uh, bonds here, so you can put your node address in. Oh, that's fixed, that's good. Um, and have a look what's going on there and, and monitor nodes, so that's pretty cool. And then if you go back to assets within uh, uh, Rune, this is native Rune, you go to deposit, you're gonna have more bits to um, bond, unbond, leaves. That's add liquidity or add bond to your node. Um, remove bond from your node, 
um, leave or to do a custom memo, which is really cool. Normally you do this through the Binance Dex interface. Now this is all done in here. So um, this interface is going to assist node operators in managing their node. Thanks for watching. And I hope this gives you a good understanding of vaults within ThorChain and the incentive pendulum. If you like this video, please hit the thumbs up and subscribe to see more content like this. In the next video in this series, I'll be talking about node security. So how the Asgard Vault is created, uh, TSS being Threshold Signature Scheme, as well as the churn process. Until next time, thanks and bye.